want to welcome everybody here this evening, um, both in person and online. We are grateful that uh, we could all be together and have this experience. Um, race matters for juvenile justice. I first um, became aware of, of the, uh, the power of this uh, gift and program for our community um, last fall, and then some of us in this very room were able to go through some of the uh, racial justice training, um, and then uh, participate in some of their ongoing work on their monthly uh, rooms, and so it's been a wonderful gift. And then I became aware of this impl implicit bias training, and uh, so Carol and I started talking, and we thought, you know, this might be a really, really great opportunity for our congregation to have a chance to listen and learn and be challenged, but also to see all the opportunities for growth that can come out of, of, um, of knowledge, of self-awareness. And then we decided, hey, let's extend this out beyond just people who are able to be here. So we have friends I know that are on uh, in Raleigh and some other groups that, um, that I've participated in and some folks also from the Charlotte area. It is, again, my pleasure to um, welcome you all here this evening. Um, we're going to... Um, have an opportunity uh, to spend some time listening and learning, um, and I know Carol's going to do more of an extensive introduction, but uh, uh, Judge Lou um, Troche is here tonight, and um, he's going to be sharing with us uh, his experience and um, uh, leadership development of race matter matters for juvenile justice. Bathrooms, I think everybody here, there's a few that probably don't, bathrooms are out this way. Um, and if you're at home, hopefully you can find your bathroom. Um, if you have a phone, just turn the ringer off or put it on, on silent. That's always a, a, great, uh, a great thing to do. And at the very end, I know the judge is going to allow some time, create some space for questions if they come up. And I know that Carol is going to field some of those questions uh, via our online as well. Um, there is a light reception that will follow. It'll be in the gathering space, so encourage as many of you who would like to to kind of continue that conversation. So again, I'm looking out here. There's a diversity of communities that are that are here and, and online as well. So again, um, thank you so much for coming and, and participating in this, and I look forward to um, I look forward this to this continued journey together with those of us who are stepping out into. Um, some really, really important justice work, not only in our community, but in the world. Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy that you're all here. Uh, this has been a long time in the planning. We are so delighted to welcome Judge Trosh tonight. And uh, let me tell you, his bio we could spend the next hour on his bio, it's amazing. Um, I'm not gonna give you the hour version, but I did wanna hit some highlights so you know who your presenter is and uh, why he might be an expert in what he's talking about tonight. So um, Judge Trosh is Superior Court Judge in the 26th District, Judicial District of Mecklenburg County, and he and his wife, Kathy, have two wonderful children, Lou and Presley. He graduated from West Charlotte High School, so he's a Charlotte native, and received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Washington and Lee, followed by his uh, Juris Doctor at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, whoop whoop, if you happen to be a fan of uh, that particular Carolina. Uh, so he served as District Court Judge in the Juvenile and Family Courts for 20 years from 1999 until he was elected as Superior Court Judge in 2018. In July of 2010, he was the first judge in North Carolina to be certified by the National Association of the Council for Children as a Child Welfare Law Specialist. He continues to lead many collaborative reform efforts underway in Mecklenburg County, and in rec recognition of this cooperative approach, in May of 2012, he was presented with the Lucille P. Giles Volunteerism Award by Florence Crittenden Services for his collaborative work on behalf of children and families. He has become nationally recognized as an expert regarding collaboration between court systems and various community groups and has traveled across the United States speaking on this topic 
and has twice testified before Congress. Thank you, and oh my gosh, we'll have that whole conversation. I cannot even imagine. What? Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it because I can't, can't uh, having watched several of those things, that's a little scary, really. Um, also traveled to participate with a team of local officials in the, cen in the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform Certificate Program for public sector leaders to plan multi-systems approach to child welfare issues. Locally, he co-chairs Mecklenburg County's Race Matters for Juvenile Justice Initiative, which is where we found out about Judge Trosh and his wonderful work. Um, this initiative is dedicated to ending disparate outcomes for children in the 26th Judicial District. Under his leadership, RMJJ has become a model for change in communities across the nation. It is my honor to welcome him once again to Advent. I think I'm, am I on? I'm on. Thank you, Pastor Ward, Carol, for inviting me, and all of you all for inviting me to come. As you all can see on the uh, screen, my uh, esteemed partner, uh, Judge Ricky McCoy Mitchell, uh, was supposed to be here tonight. She has a mother who has some significant health problems, and so she had an issue um, where she, at the last minute, couldn't come. So she extends her apologies, and I told her that our prayer, we were in a good place that, that I would ask you all to make sure that her and her family are in your prayers. Uh, I also will say, I did grow up in Charlotte. My daughter, uh, cello teacher, is here from Randolph Middle School, and we just talked. Um, and uh, I appreciate Carol making me sound so good, but um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the, the front that I put on, and my wife would tell you, and my kids would tell you. Um, I, I'm here tonight to talk to you about, or to really do an introduction about what is this thing called implicit bias. I've been talking about this, and I'm going to walk around a little bit if that's okay, but I've been talking about this um, subject now for over a decade, and I will let you know that when I first started talking about this, in fact, when I first became aware of implicit bias, I was with a group of judges from across the country um, with an organization called the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. And so they had brought all of these judges together. Um, we had something called the Model Court Program, where all of these courts across the country uh, would work on goals to improve their child welfare and their court-serving system in juvenile courts. And so they decided that in each, each court would pick their own goal. Okay, this is circa 2007, 8, somewhere around there. And we would each pick our own goal every year, and they decided, this national organization got a grant and said, what if each court from New York City to Los Angeles, California, to smaller uh, courts like Charlotte and, and even smaller courts and mid-sized courts across the country, what if they all worked on one goal, the same goal every year? So they brought all these judges together to figure out what goal we should work on. And they thought it was going to be a two-day long argument, right? We're going to put up all the different things we could work on to improve juvenile courts. And you can think of all the programs or technological advances or training for judges or whatever it would be that we were, would all agree to work on. Within two hours, the judges at that time agreed we should work on something called disproportionality and disparities in our child uh, welfare, our foster care systems. What disproportionality and disparities, some of you know what I'm talking about, some may not. It me meant that we were all aware that children of color were overrepresented in our foster care system. And once and that's disproportionality, right? So that means that they're the percentage of, uh, in Charlotte, say if the percentage of children of color are 30%, but those children in our foster care system make up 60% of the children, that would be overrepresentation. So disproportionality can be overrepresentation based on what you would expect by, by demographics, or it could be underrepresentation. All of us across the country experienced overrepresentation. Disparity is once you're in that system, you don't fare as well. I can, I, I, you, you struggle more. And, and 
the foster care system, the best example I can come up with is that <clears throat> children of color, when they are freed for adoption, right? So their parents abandon them or their parents' parental rights are terminated. Same age, same situation, same backgrounds. It took a lot longer for children of color to find an adoptive home. We can all talk about the various reasons for that, and we, we had been talking about that for years. So the judges agreed within two hours, we need to work on that. We're tired of talking about it. We need to do something about it. So they then, through that grant, brought judges, another group of judges from across the country to Denver. We went to Denver. I guess it's centrally located, so we went to Denver, uh, and it was a uh, uh, initiative called Courts Catalyzing Change in which we all had agreed we're going to work on this issue and we were sort of the, I don't know what you would call us, the steering committee, right, for across the country. So we're talking about it and we were talking about the reasons that the, these disproportionalities and disparities kept persisting, right, and what was going on. So we started talking about it like lawyers would, right? And these are very progressive judges from across the country. They are, we were as a very diverse group of people, black judges, white judges, Hispanic judges, Native American judges, men judges, women judges, old judges. Well, judges are all mostly old, but older judges and less older judges. And we were all there together. And we talked about it in historical terms, right? We talked about the laws and what maybe the laws were passed this way or maybe this historical thing happened or another historical thing happened. And there was a psychologist who was part of the, the initiative and he sat there very quietly for a long time. And we went on and on and on and we argued some and we went back and we went forth as lawyers are wont to do. And finally, Somebody said, well, Sean, his name's Sean Marsh, do you have anything you want to say? What do you think about this? And he said, well, I had my hand up five times, but I was a little nervous trying to break into a bunch of lawyers yelling at each other. But I think there is a concept that we have in psychology, in social sciences, that you all might be um, interested in. And we're like, what, what is it? And he said, it's called implicit bias or and it's based on something called heuristics, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know what explicit bias is? And so we said, yes, we, we know what explicit bias is. And he says, well, <clears throat> there's also a concept that people make, because of the way the human brain works, people make snap subconscious judgments about other people, places, and things, and there is growing research that we've been aware of for years that that contributes to some of the things that you all are talking about that end up with systems that are systemically biased towards or against certain groups of people. What? What are you talking about? Now, you guys, maybe now it's 2022 and everybody's talking about this concept. I'm telling you, in 2008, we were like, what? are you talking about? And so that, along with something I'm going to tell you about uh, in just a second, led me to want to learn more about this concept because I couldn't figure out what else was going on. And it's, it's funny, not ha-ha funny, but ironic funny, shockingly funny, that somehow this concept, which is based on science about how our brain works, has somehow become a political statement about who you are as a person, which team you're on. Are you in the blue team or the red team? And this is one of the ways we can determine whether we're on the blue team or the red team. I can promise you for the first eight years, nine years that I presented about this, there was none of this blue team, red team. Everybody would hear this information and go, oh, that helps me make a little more sense about the world that I live in and why sometimes I do things or think things that later I'll look back on and go, gosh, I really got that wrong. I don't know how we got, maybe it's how everything else in this country got to everything. You've got to have a marker and you're on the blue team or the red team. I'm not making a political statement here tonight. I'm just telling you what the science says. 
what my experience has been and how I believe that it has contributed to the disparities and the disproportionalities in the system in which I work. This is what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm, I'm in the middle of introducing myself. Carol did a way better job of introducing me than I ever could myself. Made me sound, I, I feel good about I should pat myself on the back. I feel much better about myself. Um, I could tell you about the time I got arrested and spent a night in jail, but I won't. Um, Carol can do that next time I come. She'll, I'll tell her about when we, I spent a night in Beaufort County Jail. Uh, that's Beaufort. That's South Carolina, not Beaufort, North Carolina. At any rate... Then we're going to talk about the science of bias. In other words, what's going on in our brains? We're going to learn a, bit, a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the difference a little bit about explicit versus implicit bias. And then how individual bias leads to systemic bias. So we'll sort of build that out. And then finally, we'll talk very quickly, a teaser about we have, a, uh, we have a number of modules with Race Matters for Juvenile Justice that we speak about. Implicit Bias 1, which is what we did for years, was what I'm going to mainly talk to you about tonight. But we created another one called Implicit Bias 2, which talks about, well, what do you do about this? Now that you have this information, do you just say, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm doomed to see the world in a certain way and there's nothing I can do about it? Or are there strategies that you can embark on to mitigate some of the impacts of the, the way that your brain works when it has negative uh, results. And then we'll, uh, I'll try to save some time for reflections and questions. I will tell you I'm a rambler, and I, I'll just start telling stories and stuff that I'm supposed to say. Um, um, I'll go into some other direction, and normally I've got Judge McCoy Mitchell or Judge Hands or somebody else with me to look at me and go, what are you doing? Or sometimes they bring a hook and they'll just pull me off stage, but you're stuck with me solo tonight. So uh, uh, strap it in. And it, at any point, if you guys are like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, you need to, to move forward, just let me know. So I told you about my involvement with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges as one impetus for me to start looking into this thing called implicit bias. But before that happened, and I know I'm getting older because if you want to know what's on my socks, this is my grandson. So if you want to want, that's my grandson. He's one year old yesterday. Um, and so I, I'm old enough to have a grandchild. But when I started talking about this uh, concept of implicit bias, this story that I'm getting ready to tell you was about a year or two before. Now it's like 10 years before, but it is what it is. We, we all go on in life and age. At any rate, I'm in juvenile court, okay? Now, juvenile court is a closed court. It's, it's an open court, but we've designed the courts. They're very small. For the most part, the only people that come into the hearings are the children, their families, and then the social workers or case managers or therapists or probation officers and lawyers that work with them. So it's not like a big, huge public courtroom like you might see in an adult criminal courtroom. We were doing first appearance hearings. First appearance hearings, this is in delinquency court then. So delinquency court is like crime for kids, right? We have a separate system where, that's focused on rehabilitation for juveniles. You may have seen one of those reality shows about juvie hall or whatever. Um, it's not really like that. But we, so I'm working in that system. Many of the concepts are the same, but they're changed a little bit for children. So, I am handling first appearance hearings. When you are charged with a felony, so you've committed a serious offense, you're generally put in detention, and then you go before a judge. This is in juvenile court. Same thing happens in adult court, but a little bit different. We don't have bonds in juvenile court. There's no bail system. A it's like the federal court system. You may or may not know this, but in the, fe the federal court system, if somebody's arrested and charged with a federal crime, the judge, the magistrate or the judge, makes a determination based on a list of risk factors whether somebody should stay in detention or not. In the state system, adult system, usually bail, money bail is set. Now, there's a whole other argument. We're not talking about that tonight, about that system and what ramifications the money bail system has. But that's the system in the adult court. In juvenile court, that's not how it works. 
A judge has a list of factors to try and determine whether that young man or young woman is a danger to the community. And if they're a danger to the community, what can we do to ameliorate that or make sure they stay under control and they can be at home with their family and go to school, et cetera? So that's what you do in a first appearance, as well as telling the young man or young woman, this is what you're charged with. Here's your lawyer. We're going to set another court date. What does the state intend to do with that? Sort of the very beginning of the case. So that's what I'm doing. I have those two cases. And then, because those kids had just been arrested over the, overnight, the night before, they kind of got added onto my calendar at the last second, right? So I had a whole other docket to get to. So I know that, right? And so I don't have a ton of time to, to hear these cases. That's just remember that in the back of your mind, okay? So call the first case in. Just as I expected, the young man comes out of, we'll call the, he comes out of this door, so I'll call this door number two. He comes out of this door, he walks in, he is, we, they don't wear jumpsuits in our juvenile court facility, but he's in his clothes, but, and they've taken the shackles off, and he comes and he sits down. So he's in detention, okay, he's been detained. He sits down at the council table with his lawyer here. At the, this table, in the middle table, there are case managers and what are called court counselors, which are kind of like probation officers, but they also make reports to the court and supervise kids while we're waiting for trial. So they're all sitting here. At this table is the district attorney, and you all know what the district attorney is. That's the prosecutor, okay? So they're at that table. So they're all in my court. I'm sitting up in the front. And I learn that this young man, along with his co-defendant, watched the movie. Well, I don't learn this at first. I'll learn this later. But they watched, you remember the movie Ocean's 11 or 12 or 13? Maybe they're up to Ocean's 75 now. I don't know. There's all kind of Ocean's movies, right? But this is the one where, I think it's the first one where they pull the heist on the bad casino owner, really the mean, evil guy. And so those, these criminals get together, but they're really kind of like Robin Hood and they rob the, the casino. So these two kids are spending the night at one of the guy's houses uh, in an area of Charlotte that is um, an upper middle class neighborhood, okay? They go to a high school in Charlotte. I went to West Charlotte. My kids went to East Mac. This is a school so that's, um, they're very she-she public schools. Is that, is that, uh, uh, this, my school, East Mac wasn't where my kids went. East Mac was a great school, but this is like your Audrey Kells of the world, maybe Huff High School, okay? Wasn't either one of those, but a school like that. Nothing wrong, but just, it, that's where they're from, right? So they are at one of the kids' houses. They watch the movie. They decide we're going to pull a heist. But as you all know, in North Carolina, gambling's illegal, other than the state for, to support the state lottery. So we don't have any casinos. We do have a lot of fast food restaurants. So they wander over to the fast food restaurant near where one of them lives, and they try to rob the McDonald's. They, have, uh, they both have um, what we, at this time, we thought were revolvers, but if you've ever seen, they, we, they turned out to be BB guns or pellet guns, but if you've ever seen pellet guns or BB guns, they're not like the Red Ryder BB gun from that movie. They look like real Glocks or 357s. They look like the real thing. So they go in, they try to rob the McDonald's. They are terrible criminals. They get two hamburgers, half a pack of French fries, and $3, and get caught in the parking lot and arrested. Okay? So, they go, so he's there. I learn all this. I then hear from the, I, I hear from the uh, court counselor, and the court counselor says, well, judge, this is an unusual young man in that he's ne this is a really serious crime, this armed robbery, and he's never done anything like this before. Most of the kids that I have that commit armed robbery, you don't just start out committing an armed robbery. And then I look out in the courtroom, and I forgot to tell you this, but out of this door, this is to the lobby, when I called the case in, a horde of people came in. That doesn't usually happen in juvenile court. Unfortunately, in juvenile court, a lot of the kids that I deal with in juvenile court, their mom comes, maybe their grandparent comes, maybe once in a while a dad comes. That's about it. In this case, I had 
mom and dad and uh, cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents. I had a pastor from this kid's church. All came into my courtroom, and they had a stack of letters. So the court counselor, the probation officer, and the, and the case manager, the mental health case manager, stand up and say, Judge, we've been talking to the family in the hall. They say, this is not who this young man is. This is not, not reflective of anything about him. And here are all the letters. So they hand me all the letters. And then <clears throat> the defense attorney is, is next, and the defense attorney says, Judge, that's right, I'd like you to hear. And so I hear from a couple family members. Kid's never been in trouble. He's an average, not a great student, but he's an average student. He's never been suspended from school. I don't even think he ever had ISS in school, which is in-school suspension. And you can tell us that's, that's almost impossible. Um, I mean, I, was, I came up in school at a time when you didn't get suspended. They paddled you. And I got paddled all the time, right? So I would have been in school suspension all the time. So to get all the way to, I think he was in ninth grade, and never have been suspended, so I'm like, okay, and he's got his, both his parents are there, and they're very supportive, and he lives in this upper middle class neighborhood, and he's got all kinds of family support. He's got community support. The pastor stands up and tells me how he's really active in their uh, youth ministry. In fact, he plays a drum in their, drums in their, in their band at their church, and he's a great kid. And so I hear, oh, no, no. okay, wow. So then I say, ask the DA what they say. And they say, well, Judge, it sounds like this young man might be a candidate for our Alternatives to Detention Program, uh, ATD, which basically means, okay, if all this checks out, even though you've committed this really serious offense, We'll put an ankle monitor on you, an electronic monitor on you. You'll have some intensive supervision and a very strict set of rules, and your court counselor will check on you much more frequently. So intensive supervision. But judge, we want to make sure all this checks out. And the defense attorney says, we understand that, judge. And I said, I, I agree with that. And the court counselor says, yeah, we'd like to check this out and make sure that everything we're hearing today is in fact correct. There's nothing more to the story. And I said, well, that makes sense. Normally we would come back, this is a Monday, normally we would have come back the next Monday, a week later, and then they would have reported whether he's eligible for this release program. Everybody with me? He would have stayed in detention for a week and then he'd get out. The, the defense lawyer says, Judge, the only thing we're asking is can we do it Thursday? Because he, really he really needs to stay on top of his studies. He needs to be back in school. Um, could we do it on Thursday instead of Monday? So I say to the court counsel, the case manager, can y'all get that done? Can you get the assessment done by then? They say, yes, we can do it. Fine. We'll come back on Thursday at 1.30, and I'm thinking he's going to get out on the monitor, and then we'll see what happens later. Let the case go. The horde of people all leaves the courtroom. They take him back into detention. Family's not happy about it, but I, I've tried to make them understand that's kind of where we are because it's such a serious crime, right? It's about as serious as we get in juvenile court. So I call the second case in. I call in the co-defendant. Again, I'm in a hurry, right? So I call the co-defendant in. Another horde of people come in, right? This is like two times in one day. Grandma, grandpa, this time a teacher comes from school. And no offense, but... Teachers never came to my courtroom unless they were subpoenaed. Well, the, it was a coach from one of the teams. Like, uh, I can't remember which team it was, but he was both a PE coach, a teacher, and a coach, and he knew this kid. He came in, and they had the stack of letters, and the neighbors, and the grandpa, and the grandma, and his brother was there, and his brother was like in his little suit thing. And so, meanwhile, while I'm waiting and I'm in a hurry, my deputy, I was wondering if you all would get the reference, but... Don't take any offense, but I, sometimes when I speak and I talk about the Andy Griffith Show, nobody knows what I'm talking about. But I think in this audience I'm safe. Um, so it's it, people of a certain age, right? I, I mean, I'm, I, I got grandkids, but um, if I was talking to my daughter's groups, they, would, they have no idea what, what that show is. But anyway, you remember Barney Fife, right? So my bailiff's like Barney Fife, just sitting there, laying against the wall. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting for him to get up and go get the, the co-defendant. And I finally say, Mr. Bailiff, would you please go get Johnny, the co-defendant? He says, Judge, there's nobody else back there. 
I said, yes, there is. The co-defendant, you know, the arm, we got two of them, right? Oh, wait, let me check the docket. Said, yeah, yeah, he's back there. Go get him. Judge, I just put everybody back there. There's nobody else back there. Then I, I look up, and the kid that I thought was the brother or the cousin or something is the kid because he's now up in front, and he's sitting over here with his lawyer. Okay, so he's sitting here with his lawyer. Same group of people. Our juvenile courts work in teams, right? So I had the same prosecutor generally, the same defense attorneys, same case manager, same court counselors, right? So same people I'm working with. So they're all the same. So he comes and he sits down. So we go through the same process, right? I let him know what the charges are. I let him know when the next court date's going to be. I let him know what he's facing, all those kinds of things. He's got his lawyer there who's an appointed lawyer from the Council for Children's Rights. And then I say, well, what do we need to do with regard to detention? Court counselor stands up, says, Judge, we think that he uh, should remain on house arrest, meaning he can't go anywhere unless he's going to school or he's going to the doctor to get specific permission. He should stay away from his co-defendant. He should go to Burger King from now on to get his food. He can't go, or Wendy's. He can't go back to a McDonald's especially this McDonald's, and then a whole series of rules that he would have to follow. Pretty standard. So they say that. Case manager agrees, uh, the, the mental health case manager agrees. District attorney stands up and says, we're good with that. Oh, defense attorney's over here. Defense attorney says, we're good with that too, judge. And then I say, and this is where I found out all about Ocean's Eleven. I didn't hear about that at the beginning. I was like, well, I know we do each detention hearing individually, but these are co-defendants. And I note that he's not in detention. He's with his family. Was the other guy the gunman? No, they both had these, at this time we thought, Glocks. Was the other guy, was it his idea? No, they came up with, I find out they watched Ocean's Eleven. Do, they, are, are, do these guys know each other? Like, how, oh, no, the, yeah, they've been best friends since they were six years old. They live one street over from one another. Their parents are actually friends. They're not best friends, but they're acquaintances, and they have cookouts or whatever in the neighborhood. Does the other guy have a drug problem? No, neither one of them's ever been in trouble. Neither one of them's ever been suspended. Both of them have people, a huge support system. I'm asking question, 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 right? Because... I can't figure out what's going on. Usually, it, it kind of all makes sense what's happening. I don't always agree, but I don't understand. And I see in my courtroom, and by the way, defense counsel, African-American woman, district attorney, African-American, no, white woman, mental health, I mean, uh, court counselor, African-American man, and uh, case manager, white female, I believe. I say all that not because I'm trying to get it, but those are the people. And as I'm talking, I see the light bulbs go off. What do you all think the light bulbs are going off about? Like, what do you think the difference between these two young men was? Yeah, so all y'all know, one of them was white and one of them was black. You also know which one was in detention and which one was home with their family. I told this story. I, I try to tell a thousand other different stories, but everybody always wants to hear this story, so I've given up. This is the one I'm just going to tell until the day I die. Um, because it, I think it really hammers home the point, right? <clears throat> So, I hear this, and I said um, to myself, the same thing all Americans do. This is what we've been taught to do when we see something biased or prejudicial or racial, racial disparities happen in front of us. I look for the bad person. I look for the person that must have a Nazi flag in their closet. I look for 
Again, another reference I took out of this speech because I didn't know, but you all would get it, Archie Bunker. That's who I was looking for. Right? Because somebody in our system had to decide they were going to treat the black kid and the white kid differently and do it on purpose. Right? Maybe it was the police officer who originally arrested him. No, they're not the ones that actually make that decision. It must have been the court counselors because they're the ones that make the initial decision. Or maybe it was the judge that signed that secure custody order for the one kid and not the other. Didn't, maybe they're the ones that did it. Or maybe it was the prosecutor who said, who, who really, and I'm, all that's going through my mind, right? I want to find the bad person, right? Because it's so much easier if George Floyd ended up in the position that he was in because that officer is a bad guy. That's so much easier because we can just get rid of him, right? We can blame it on him. We can punish him. And then we can walk around, not me. I wouldn't have done that. So I'm thinking all this, right? But then I think right out on the heels of that, this is all going on in my mind in that moment. Wait a minute. I work with these guys every single day. And unless I'm completely missing something, I've never seen them do that. Any of them. I knew the officer who had made the arrest. I knew the judge, obviously, who had made, it wasn't me, but I knew the judge very well who had signed the secured custody orders. I knew the court counselor, the DA, the defense, I knew all of them. And they weren't all old white guys. They were all races, all sexes, different ages, and they all missed it. All of them. And they all did it without trying, unintentionally. It just happened. But the impact in that one case to, to those two young men, if I had followed through with that, one's in detention, maybe only for a week, but he's in detention for a week. And then he's got to walk around the school with a monitor on his ankle so everybody knows. And the other kid walks through the halls. Nobody has to know. And who do you think everybody in that school is expecting is going to be the one that gets in trouble and wearing the monitor? And what message are we sending back to that school? And all this is going through. And then I thought the worst thing of all, which is, shh, I'm in a, can I say a curse word? I do that when I'm not wearing my robe, I curse sometimes. So I for, please forgive me if it offends anybody. Or just get up and walk out. But I said, shit. How many times? Like, this is obvious, right? The story I just told you is obvious. How could you not see two identically situated kids do the same thing and be treated so differently? Right? That's, it like hit me in the face. And then I thought, how many times has this happened? And I was the person that signed on, that didn't notice. Because that day, I'm the hero of the story, right? I ask all the questions. I locked the white kid up, too. He had to wait a week. They both got, by the way, they both get out later on uh, this intensive uh, supervision. They plead guilty to lesser crimes because, again, we found out they were BB guns, not real weapons. And they never got in trouble again, at least that I know. We never saw them in juvenile court. They really were stupid teenagers that did stupid things, just like I was the night I got arrested for stealing a sign that said cold beer. Because um, I wanted to see a ghost, but that's a whole other story. At any rate, so, but how many times was I not the hero? And I started thinking about it, and it was a lot. So both of those two things led me to say, what, something else is going on, something that I've been told about the way we see the world and how things happen is different than I grew up understanding or that I'm understanding in this situation. And maybe it impacts me and the people that I work with, and it certainly impacts the people that come before me in court every day. So let's talk about that. Brain science. Let's talk about how your brain works. There's something in your brain, the little red thing there, it's called the amygdala. There are two of them, the amygdala, and the amygdala are the two things. Amygdala, I think, is one. Some of you that know Greek know the plural, the, not plural, but anyway, amygdala, I think, is, is two. You have two of these structures in your brain. Amygdala is one of them. But at any rate, there are these little 
almond-shaped uh, structures that are in your brain. And in fact, amygdala means almond in uh, Greek. It's the Greek word for almond. And those two little almonds in your brain are critical to how you perceive especially stressful events. This is a real complicated diagram, but basically what it means is when you are in a situation, flight or fright or flee, one of those situations, fight, flight, or free, flee, excuse me, or freeze, when you're in one of those situations, a couple things happen. Your senses, your touch, your, eye, your eyesight, your vision, your hearing, your smell, goes to a couple parts of your brain. It goes to the limbic system, which is sort of unthinking, right? That's where the, the amygdala are. It also goes to the cortex, now, I like to view the cortex as like the board of directors. Y'all have some, what do y'all have here? Deacons or something? I don't know, what, what do y'all have? Huh? The council, okay? Y'all know what happens when you send something to the, to the council? They have to do a report on it, and then some research, and then they got to debate, and they got to have some more meetings, and then they got to come to the people and say, this is what we're thinking, but we haven't done it yet. What do y'all think? Then they go back to their little room, and they make some more decisions. It takes forever. It's really thought out, but it takes forever. Well, if somebody's pointing a gun at you or a ghost is running up behind you, you don't have time for the, the council to meet and research and think through it. You've got to do something now. So in fight, flight, or freeze situations, your amygdala, through your limbic system, sends out an immediate run Put up your dukes, freeze, right? Play dead. Before, and they've done experiments before, your cortex, your counsel even knows what's going on. Your cortex is like I'm, your conscious mind. Consciously, you don't know why you're running when you first start running. And they've done experiments, and people basically take three steps before they know why they're running. Because you got to survive, right? That's a mental shortcut when your conscious brain cannot act quickly enough. Your brain's got to work around, right? In these situations, we've got to be quicker. Because it could be really helpful, right? Like, if you're in the ocean with that guy, you don't want to say, hmm, you know, that's a really big creature. And I was watching, um, I think it's a shark. I remember Jaws. Boy, Jaws is a scary movie. I remember that. that was a bad movie. And, you know, I, I've been watching uh, Shark Week on Discovery Channel recently, and I realized that some sharks are really dangerous, but other sharks are not as dangerous. And I wonder, hmm, I wonder which, if, which one this is. Those are really big. You don't want to think all that stuff. Just get out of the water. Same thing with that guy in the woods, right? Just climb up a tree. You don't want to think about whether this is, you know, whether he's like Smokey the Bear or he's uh, going to eat your bear. So in fight, flight, or freeze situations, you don't have time to cognitively, I mean consciously, excuse me, process all the data. So you don't. What you do is called a heuristic. Has anybody heard that word, heuristic? Heuristic. It means mental shortcut. And they're fascinating. Without these mental shortcuts, we couldn't survive as human beings. These mental shortcuts are critical to what we do and how we have survived to evolve to who we are now. So they are a core part of who we are and how we think. And essentially, they allow people to solve problems and make decisions quickly, oftentimes without conscious awareness, in order to live our lives. 
Now, I told you one uh, situation where you have a heuristic, right? The fight, flight, or freeze with the amygdala. There are other such reasons that you do this. Another one is that right now, you are being bombarded with stimuli. Right now. Like some of you may have had dinner and it didn't agree with you and your stomach's growling, so it could be internal stimuli. Some of you are a little bit tired and you're trying to fight off falling asleep because I'm boring the heck out of you. Some of you have to go to the bathroom. Some of you may be sitting near the door and there's a cold breeze running in, or some of you may be sitting near the heater and it's hot, right? All that's happening to you all the time. You cannot process all of the bits of information, stimuli that are coming into you consciously. If you did, you would be unable to function. Subconsciously, you can process 20 million bits of information a second. Consciously, you can process about 40 bits a second. Approximately 0.01 of all your brain activity, the, imp the stuff where you're like, we got to send this to the council. Like, the people that are here on the council don't know this, but most of the church runs underneath them, right? Like, y'all just make some decisions and never tell them, right? That's how your body and your brain works. Same way. Because, other, like, for example, I have, made, and we'll talk about this later, but I make judgments about things based on past experience I create categories of things in my mind so that I don't every time I see a table have to pick it up and go what is this for does it stand I don't have to do that I can automatically uh, process things so heuristics allow you to deal with the bombardment of um, bombardment of uh, stimuli that are coming into your brain at any minute any second actually the third reason is, and we'll talk about this more in a, in a little while, but decision-making, conscious decision-making is physiologically taxing. I sit on my butt all day. That's my job. I have to sit on my, my rear end on a, at a bench in a robe and hear people talk and then make decisions. I cannot get up. I sit all day. I, get, I take breaks so I can sit up and walk around a little bit. Mainly, I just sit all day. And yet, some days I come home because all I do is make decisions all day long. And I feel like I have been beaten with a stick all day or I've run a marathon. You don't feel it in the moment in the same way you do when you're lifting weights or you're running a marathon. But it's physiologically exhausting. So these heuristics also allow you to triage what decisions do I really need to make? And what decisions do I, you know, do I, it, are just not that important. They're not worth my energy. And again, these heuristics can be helpful. I need a volunteer. Who wants to be my volunteer? Raise your hand. All right, Pastor. I need you to read the first paragraph. Please read the following, the first two lines. Read that to us, please. You sound like a Klingon. Um, you've done the best job. Usually people give up after three words, so you have done a really good job. Now I want you to read the second Actually, I want everybody to read the second part together out loud. Just start reading it out loud. So, little kids, when they're first starting to read, they, don't, they can't do that. You know the brain develops, and the more you use, you create neural pathways as you do things, and the more 
you, you use a certain skill, the, more, the stronger the neural pathway gets, right? So some things, like I play basketball, so for me, shooting a free throw, it, it's that neural pathway, probably not anymore, but back in the day, it was like a highway, because I did it, you know, a, a thousand times a day. Other things that I wasn't good at, like playing the cello, um, were probably like a little country road that nobody ever went to, right? And so our brains, because we read, and we read in a certain way, have created neural pathways that allow us to create a heuristic so we can read more efficiently and more quickly, and we didn't even know we were doing it. So you don't just learn to read, you learn to read just first and last letter, and for the most part, not all the time, but for the most part, you can get through pretty much anything. Let's do this. I want you now to read the word, okay? So the word is going to come up, and you're, you're just going to read it. So out loud, I need everybody to do this together. Ready? Give yourselves a round of applause. You're excellent readers. Seriously, give yourselves a round of applause. Why not? Okay, now I want you to say the color of the word, right? So if it's green, say green. Blue, say blue, right? So you're not, you're not reading it. You're just say the color of it. Ready? So you know that little hiccup that you feel? Y'all feel? This is called a Stroop test. And the Stroop test. Stroop. Uh, uh, I got it on here. Hold on. I think it's S-T-R-U-P. It's on my, in my presentation here. Um, Stroop. I believe it's the S-T-R-U-P test. It's, a, it's a been around for a long time, but it shows you what happens when your conscious mind is, is overriding a heuristic, right? We, we didn't, for us, when we see this, the most important thing for us is to read, right? We've created neural pathways and a heuristic, a shortcut that that's what we do, that's what we default to. In order to do something different, which is what I ask you to do, it wasn't hard when the first one was red and the color was red. That wasn't hard, was it? It wasn't hard later when blue was the same color as blue. But when it was black and the color was yellow, I heard some of y'all say black, I mean yellow. Oh, shoot. That little, and for some people you may have been more efficient, but I'm guessing everybody had a little hiccup, right? Just a little, you're, that's the override that you do. And normally we just operate without that override. I told you to override. Normally, what you would have done is you would have read first the words, and then maybe later you would have gone back and said, oh, look, that black, it's yellow. And you, you may have looked at the colors later, but that wouldn't have been the first thing that you did. You would have automatically read the words. So these heuristics are vital to us. They make it so we can survive in the world. They make it so that we can preserve our energy to make decisions. They make it possible for us to deal with all the stimuli and figure out which ones are important and that we've got to make a decision about. They, they are critical to who we are as uh, species, as creatures. But they can get us into trouble, right? They can get us into trouble. So let's talk real briefly about some heuristics. I don't know if I'm going to go through all the heuristics, but I'll go through a couple of these that are important to what I'm going to talk about. But I will let you know there are hundreds of these heuristics, and social scientists are finding more and more of these shortcuts that appear in different areas. And so let's talk about a couple of them. All of these are ways that allow you to make decisions and judgments quickly and efficiently, but they can all get you into trouble because you can make mistakes. Um, availability. Availability is a heuristic that suggests that information that comes to mind more readily or more easily believed by people 
and believed to be more accurate reflections of the world. So, I'm a lawyer. I'll give you an example of this. When I'm a judge now, but when I was a lawyer and I was going to present to a jury, and now when I see lawyers presenting to a jury, sometimes there's a lawyer that has all the facts, right? And they have all these charts and these big uh, 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 packets that they hand out that, sh that is all the data, and it shows that they're right. And then the other lawyer will stand up and say, well, I don't know about all that. My grandma told me something back when I was a boy. Let me tell you about it. And tells a story that grandma told him that's in contravention to all these facts, fancy facts and figures. And more often than not, the jury will buy what the story is rather than the Data. And I tell lawyers all the time, look, if you're going to present data, you need to present the data, but you better have a story that goes with it. Because we evolved to take in information, and it is easier for our brains to take in information in a story form. Therefore, we are more apt to believe what we hear in the story as opposed to what the data might say. In addition, that which we hear more frequently and are exposed to more frequently, we become convinced is the truth. <clears throat> According to averages, statistics, arrest statistics, at statistics from New York City's police department for the past four years, this is from 2014 to 2018, African American suspects were arrested in 54% of murders. 55% of thefts, and 49% of assaults. However, between August 18th and December 31st um, of 2014, the suspects in the four stations' coverage of murders were 74% of African-American suspects, the suspects in coverage of thefts were 84% African-American, and in assaults were 73% African-American. That message is powerful and it becomes easier for you to pull that up. In addition, I think now that I'm telling you about the heuristics, I should have asked you at the beginning, do you, I, ask, I teach at UNCC. My dad taught at UNCC um, for 40 years, so I came out this road all the time when I was a kid. Not willingly, but I came out when I was a kid when my mom wanted me out of the house and my dad would set me free out on UNCC campus. At any rate, um, so I teach out there at night. Um, I teach one class um, just because I, I enjoy doing it. And one of the things I ask my students every semester is, is crime getting worse or better? The crime rate going up or down? What do you all think? Going up? Raise your hand if you think it's going up. All right. Raise your hand if you think it's going down. Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay, so we're like, this room, we're a third, a third, a third. This is a very progressive room, and I'm talking to you about availability and, and, and uh, statistics that you may, or things that you may believe that are not, in fact, true. In my UNCC class, it's about 90% crimes going up. It's way worse than it was, right? And I know all of y'all have said at some point, we used to not have to lock the doors in our house. That's a lie. Maybe your grandparents didn't when they lived on a farm. But when I grew up in, 19, in the late 70s and early 80s, crime was at its worst. Well, certain crimes, property crimes and drug crimes were at their worst in that period. Violent crimes continued to go up until the late 80s, early 90s, and then juvenile crime was the last that finally hit its apex in like 93, juvenile crimes. Since 93 at the least, 1979 at the most, crimes have gone down. Except for, no, juvenile has gone down since 93. Except for a small blip that occurred around 2020 in certain places, certain cities. Not all cities, but certain cities. Which social scientists are now investigating whether COVID had something to do with the homicide uptick. Don't know. Or whether COVID, but that's it. And, and the uptick was an uptick. So crime was here, 
it went down to here, and then it went back up to here. Okay? Only certain, the violent crime. I know some of you are thinking, he's full of beep. There's no way that's the case. That's not my experience. Because we are exposed and told, like every four years or every two years now, half the ads on political campaigns are about rising crime rates. Right? The news every night, the first 15 minutes are about crime rates. I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina back when I was, uh, and I didn't understand this until 20 years later. I was, uh, uh, just got out of law school. We lived in Fayetteville. Anybody from Fayetteville? Oh, God. <laughs> my wife hated Fayetteville, so we were only there about a year, um, long enough for my son to be born there, and then we moved back to Charlotte. Fayetteville's a great town, but it's, it's different. Yes, it is very different. I could tell you some hilarious stories, but they're not really appropriate for um, this talk. Um, at any rate, um, in Fayetteville, I'm watching TV one night, the news, and they are talking about a, a young man that took some kind of um, hallucinogenic drug or something and passed out on a railroad track and his head was cut off. And they fit, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, oh. Of course, I watched every second. I was, oh, you know, it's like one of those, oh, can't watch that. But they get to the end of the story, and it happened in Nebraska. They literally watch the news now and see. Now, I didn't know why then. Like, what, I, at the time, I was like, why are they showing us this? Because we watch it. Because it makes us watch it. So if you watch Fox News every night, they're feeding you what you want, what makes you scared. And if you watch MSNBC, like my dad does, they feed him what he's scared of because he makes him keep watching. And the more he watches, the more available it is in his head and the more he believes it. Um, confirmation bias, I think you all kind of know this, that you t tend to believe that which you already believe. My grandfather, I'll give you a quick example. My grandfather believed that women were bad drivers. Okay, he just did. Probably are. And here's how my grandfather responded to that. Every time we passed a car that was doing something crazy on the road, like cut them off or took the wrong turn or whatever, if it was a woman driver, he would say, See? I, he'd turn to my grandmother, I told you! See? Right? Every time. They... All of them are terrible drivers. All women are terrible drivers. If it was a man, when, you know, when you get past the car and you, everybody looks over to see who's causing all this mayhem on the road, it was a man, you know what he would say? He's a terrible driver. Do you see the difference? He, as an individual, is a bad driver. That didn't compute to him that, oh, maybe men are bad drivers too. But if it was a woman, he was confirming what he already believed. See, she confirms what I already believe. See, I knew it. I, I was right. And pointed it out to my grandmother. One more I'll go, or two more I'm going to go over. Anchoring real quick. This is interesting. And a lot of these are just interesting. So I, I thought y'all had pencils, but you don't have pencils in there. I'm kind of running long, so I'm going to, going to, um, do this quickly. If I could divide this room in half, what's your name right here in the middle? David. David. So if, if everybody to the right of David was on one group, and everybody to the left of David uh, was in another group, and I had you all, the, the right group, leave the room, and then I told you guys, hand you a piece of paper and said, hey guys, the Mississippi River is not 500 miles long. How long is it? Write it down. Just guess, okay? So you all would all write it down. Then I'd have you leave the room. You'd hand it up to me. You'd leave the room. I'd come. To, you guys would come in. Then I would say, hey, guys, the Mississippi River is not 2,000 miles long. How long is it? Right? Could you write it down? And you all write it down. And then we come back and we average up. We look at all the, the numbers, right? Does anybody in here actually know? I, I once looked it up when I was giving one of these presentations. I, I knew it, but now I don't know it now. But does anybody know? Only like some weird Jeopardy person would know that. Sure. 
That's how much I know, right? So for the most part, people don't know, other than maybe a guess, like I think maybe somewhere I read. Yeah, Google it while we're doing it. You can tell us. Is it 1,200? You could be on this side. You're on the right team. You're on the right team. 2,340, okay? In general, nobody knows. The interesting part about anchoring is that this side of the room, your numbers would be everywhere. Everybody wouldn't say the same number. But your, number, your median number would, would be closer to 500. Your answers would be everywhere. Some really high, some really low. They would, your median, your average would be closer to 2,000. Why? Because your brain is triaging and going, I don't know how long the Mississippi River is. And you subconsciously use the number that you're given as an anchor, as a jumping off place especially when you know, don't know the data. And you all might say, well, yeah, wait a minute. You kind of gave us that hint in your example, right? You kind of said 500, must be near 500 or 2,000. So at University of or Columbia in New York, they did a study where they um, had students come in, and, you know, you volunteer, they pay you $10 to do the study, and this, the kids would come in, and they would fill out a, uh, a uh, questionnaire, your name, your, what class you were in, and then you had to put the last four digits of your Social Security number. That's it. And then you'd sit in a room for 15 minutes, and then they'd take you to another room, and they would ask you to estimate the value of things people don't really know what the value is, like some weird vase, or how much is is this lectern work, or, or just so, something that people generally don't know, like you don't know how long the Mississippi River is. They showed that those students used the last four digits of their, of their Social Security number as an anchor. Again, they didn't just put it down, but they, they subconsciously used it as their jumping off place. Again, in this case, the social science says it's to save is to, to triage, right? To, to your brain to say, I don't, I don't want to use the energy to try and decide what a vase is worth that I don't have any idea. So I'll just use the number that I already got and call it a day, move on. They did a study uh, uh, to show how this can play out in real life. They did a study of judges, and they gave judges a realistic case material about an alleged sexual assault. After reviewing all the evidence in the case and hearing both sides, uh, the journalist, a journalist, supposed journalist, would ask the judges, do you think the sentence for the defendant in this case will be higher or lower than one year? Or to other judges, do you believe that the sentence in this case will be higher or lower than three years? The finding suggests that given the higher, suggested that those that were given the higher sentencing anchor gave higher sentences. So, it, it, so if, if the journalist said three years, then those judges would say, oh, no, I think it's going to be like two and a half years, four years, whatever. And the ones that get, got the lower Q or anchor would use lower uh, figures. Just World, uh, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing, I was doing the thing. Just World, I'll skip this one, but it's basically the belief that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. It's why when we have rape cases, everybody focuses on the victim. She must have done, and women more than men when they've studied, she must have done something bad. She was dressed this way. I wouldn't have gone there. Because, again, if you don't live in a just world, it's a pretty scary world to live in, right? If everything really is just random and anybody could, could be the victim of anything at any point or anything could happen at any point, it's hard to live in a world like that. So we have a heuristic that helps us function. The one I want to talk to you most about, and then we'll move on, is categorizing and generalizing. I talked to you a little bit about this, but basically the way that you remember things is by putting, organizing uh, new things that you come into contact. So this is people, places, and things into conceptual categories. And then once you put them into categories like things you read, Right? So this is a book, 
but a magazine, all those, all those kinds of things would go into that category. Places. If I ask you to think about the beach, a certain category of things would come up about the beach. And, and if I ask you all, you know, it would be waves or dolphins or sand or whatever, but there's a, category, a bunch of things that we put in that category. People. <clears throat> I'm six foot six. I, guar- I told you I played basketball a little while ago, but I guarantee if I'd never told you that, you would have, you, and we're in the reception later, you'd ask me where I play basketball because you're trying to size me up. And you're just making an assumption that I play basketball because I'm six foot six, right? I had a friend in college who was six five, and we would go to bars or parties, and we would get, we'd meet somebody new, and they'd say, hi, hi, I'm Lou. Hi, I'm Lou. Hello, Pam. And Pam would say, do you play basketball? And I would say, yes. And then she might say, who do you play for? That's usually the two questions everybody asks. And then she, if she was really a big basketball fan, she might say, what position did you play? And she'd let it go. Good to meet you, Pam. I go get my drink and go on with my night. My poor friend, who's also my height, Scott, would come up. Hi, I'm Scott. Nice to meet you. Pam, nice to meet you. Pam would say, you play basketball. And he'd say, no. <laughs> what? I mean, you don't play basketball. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a high jumper. He was a high jumper. Oh, well, tell me about that. Because she didn't have, a, you know, a high jumper. What? Are they tall? What, what are they? Because what, what? in our culture, you know, tall people, basketball, not high. So she'd have to re-find something to give her a quick way to put him in a category, right? So she could remember him and decide whether he's a potential mate, he's somebody to be afraid of. I'm not trying to suss you out there, Pam, but whether he's somebody that's dangerous, right? As somebody that's a potential ally. She's trying to figure all that out and figure it out quickly. So she puts him in a category, which makes sense, right? Totally makes sense. But most of the time in our society, tall people do play basketball. But sometimes they're high jumpers. Sometimes they play the cello. Or the, yeah, they probably play the, see, there you go. Why can't they play the violin? Can't they play the violin? Always make the tall people go play the bass. So now, in addition to putting those things into categories, those categories then have certain characteristics that you ascribe to things in that category. And you can see where that might be a problem, right? So let's talk about that. So, I keep pushing the wrong button. So, because you put things into categories and you confirm your biases and what's most available to you is what you remember and what you accept is true, you have made ju- you have, have unconscious judgments about me based on what I'm, what I'm wearing, how I talk, how tall I am, what color I am, am I young or old, right? And each one of those, you can kind of think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, again, so you can size people, places, and things up very quickly, and not every time you run into something you drink out of, have to figure out, do I drink from the bottom, do I put it on my head, you know, what, what do I do with this thing? I can figure out a bottle of water or a cup or a glass pretty quickly because of these heuristics. But they also lead to bias. And what I want you to understand and what I want to get into is that biases, therefore, are entirely normal. Now, there's explicit bias. That's Richard Spencer, the organizer of the Charlottesville rally where they all carried their torches and marched around like Nazis a few years ago. For a while, I am, I am embarrassed to say with RMJJ when we were making these speeches, we would say things like, you know, we've really done a great job in this country dealing with explicit biases. You know, the civil rights movement, a lot of growth has happened in this country, and we've really dealt with the fact, and, and people don't tend to have openly 
hostile beliefs or stereotypes, negative or positive, towards specific groups of people. And most of our audience would say, yeah, that's, that's right. Well, now that they sell Nazi flags at rallies, at political rallies, and nobody seems to make a big deal about it, or Kanye West makes anti-Semitic remarks and somehow it takes three days for Adidas to drop him, or uh, Donald Trump does what he does about certain groups of people, or we have a law, the laws that are passed in, in many states about um, what we're, wh whether you're allowed to say the word gay in school or not. Explicit bias has, I don't think it ever went away. I think we, people were naive or wanted to believe something, and it was just down in the basement in the closet. So explicit bias is obviously, it continues and probably always will be a problem among human beings. But implicit bias, which is different but related somehow and often leads to explicit bias, right? It's sort of the the cousin, the, the quieter cousin of explicit bias. It operates outside of your awareness. It is judgment <clears throat> or behaviors that result from subtle cognitive processes that operate at a level below conscious awareness. Not because you're trying, but because you're a human being. And sometimes people have biases that they wish they didn't have that are against everything they have grown up believing or, 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 or believe that they believe or they consciously believe about the world. But when they see certain, and you know when you can tell? When you get cut, I, I, I use that example with my grandfather on purpose. When somebody cuts you off in a car and they're not you, in other words, for me, it's not, they're not a white guy, see what you think. Or they're a white guy driving a different kind of car than I drive, Right? See what happens to you. That's when you make when you're aware, because usually you're not aware, and you can override them. Now, measuring this bias is really important. In fact, there is a test that you can take called uh, implicit the implicit bias test at Harvard.edu. If you want to do that, and you can take those tests, it's basically set up on a computer, and you push computer keys, and it will tell you. If you have, and it's not just about race, there's gender, there's disabilities, there's age, uh, there are um, religious um, connotations, um, ethnic um, um, tests that you can take about whether you have biases for or against groups of people that you may not know. So do you all want to do one to see? Would you all like to do a sort of a down and dirty Implicit bias test? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I need you to get, sit however you're sitting, be able to tap on your right, put your left hand on your left knee or leg and your right hand on your right leg. And you're going to simulate computer keys with your left and right knees. You're going to, res oops, you're going to respond to the cues by tapping either lightly with your left hand on your leg or your right hand on your leg. You're going to see a circle of words, and these are either names or, I think it's valence, good or bad, right? Justice or death, right? Good words or bad words, or names. And you're going to go in a clockwise direction, either tapping your left or tapping your right based on the instructions that you're giving. And you've got to go all the way through the circle one time quickly, as accurately as you can, and if you get it wrong, tap the right knee before moving to the next word. Everybody with me? Okay. First, let's look at the categories, the name categories, and this is divided into, an, a lot of what I talk about, by the way, is black and white, because in our culture, this is where you see things the most start. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the American problem, right? And so you see differences and biases across a lot of different domains. And I'm not minimizing any of those biases, right, in, in any way, whether it's age or sexual orientation or um, economic class. Those are all there. But you see bias the most starkly when we talk about white and black. 
So these are names that they that the creators of this exercise that are traditionally people would say, oh, that sounds like a black person or that sounds like a white person. Obviously, that's these are stereotypical, right? But that's those are the names. Words, good, bad words, right? Joy, laughter, peace, happy versus hatred, terrible, war, awful. So first, <clears throat> we're going to have a series of names. If it is a white-sounding name, you tap with your right knee. If it's an African-American or black-sounding name to you, tap on your left knee. If you get it wrong, you've got to correct it and then move on. Go around once, okay? Start where it says start and go all the way around the circle. Hey, let's do it, another one. We're going to mix the words now together. Uh, so left for a word that's a bad word, valence word, or a black sounding name. Right for a word, a good word, or a white sounding name. Okay? So you have to kind of keep all that in mind. So you see the instructions. Go. You guys are getting much better at this. Okay. Good job. You're getting better. Left for a white sounding name. So we're switching it up. Black name, right knee. Okay? Go. Just want to make sure you can do it on both sides. Okay. One more. Left for bad or white, bad word or white name, right for a good word or a black name. Go. All right, you, want, you, you can get through this. So every time I have given this lecture and had people do this exercise, the same thing happens. At the very beginning, people... Or like, oh, this is kind of weird. I don't know how to do it. So you're kind of all over the place. By the third or fourth try, you all sound like a well-oiled machine. The whole room's like that. Y'all don't know that, but I'm listening. It's all like that. Then we get to this slide. And we hear nervous laughter. People quit. Some people get uncomfortable. It takes forever. You all sound like you're all over the place. And the reason is because our categories for people put good words with white people and bad words with black people. So it is much easier for you to pull up and connect bad words and black people and good words and white people. Now, if you're on the red team, you're, uh, there's some other explanation for that other than science. But it is what it is. 
and everybody does it in every audience I've ever had. Uh, I'm going to skip the the um, this uh, uh, video because I'm going on too long. I want to tell you about one other research because that's right. That's a little exercise. It seems kind of, you feel kind of bad. Oh, I can't believe it. I did that. If you want to know more about it, go and take those. That's kind of how those tests work. And you, that hiccup that you have is the same thing as the colors earlier, right? The red, green, black, yellow thing. But this is the real, now let's look at how that plays out in the real world. Jennifer Eberhardt is a MacArthur genius. She graduated from Harvard. She taught at Yale. Now she's at Stanford. So she's like, la, academic, right? She actually won the MacArthur Genius Award. I think I said that. She created a study where at Berkeley and Stanford, so they were students, and they were presented with 41 frames. And you can see how frame one is sort of looks like a gray, the old gray TV screen when the TV turned off, back when it used to turn off at midnight or one. And each couple seconds, the frame will switch. Every couple seconds, the frame switches until frame 41, the very last frame, is a very clear image that you can see is, was there under frame one right? And so the, the goal of the participant is to push the button on the computer when they, whichever frame they're at, when they can tell what the object is. Are you with me? Those objects were divided into crime relevant or crime irrelevant um, images. So the crime relevant images were a gun knife, or handcuffs. Crime ir irrelevant were things like a stapler, a bugle, or a cup and saucer. Okay, so not, so different things. The participants didn't know that had anything to do with anything. Now the groups were divided, the students were divided into three groups. One group got no prime. That means they saw image one, it shifted to image two, to image three, to image four, to image five, to image six, all the way to 41. Group two got what was called a white prime. Y'all ever heard of subliminal messages? They got a subliminal message. They got a picture from the Stanford um, uh, yearbook of Stanford students or faculty, white Stanford students or faculty, all in, they were all in like the same white shirts with ties or white uh, shirts with these like sweater things, so whatever they wore for their angle. So they're all wearing the same thing, same expression on their face. It's just the yearbook kind of picture, right? You know, that stupid picture. Well, they were shown those for 30 milliseconds, which is like that. So quickly that at the end, they, would, they asked the students, did you see anything other than the screen, the, vi the, the gray screens? And they were unable to know that they saw these faces at all. They didn't know they saw the faces. Subconsciously, they're able to see the faces, but consciously, they did not know they saw the faces. The other group received a black prime, or what she called a black prime. That is, African-American students or faculty from, from Stanford. Again, same yearbook photos from here up, same stupid yearbook expression, right? For 30 milliseconds. So let's see what happened. So for the crime... The irrelevant objects, it really didn't make any difference. 22 or 23, 24, 23, whether you got no prime, white prime, or black prime, you saw the cup and saucer around the 23rd uh, screen, right? Uh, uh, screenshot. What about crime relevant objects? Well, if you got no prime, in other words, you didn't see a white face or a black face in between each of these little screens, no difference. Saw it at 23. What if you got a white prime? Why? Well, it took you longer. That's a statistically significant, roughly 27 frames it took you to see. You were inhibited from seeing a crime object, a gun, when you were seeing subconsciously a white face that you didn't know you saw. You were disinhibited or encouraged to see the crime-relevant objects if you 
saw a black face that you didn't know that you saw. So imagine how that impacts police officers who we want to say it's one bad police officer in a situation where they have to make a split decision or they're looking for who did what or who might be the dangerous person in the area. I'm going to stop in a second, but I do want to talk to you about the impact of these now individual biases on larger systems, and I'm going to be fairly brief but because I know we're getting to the end here. Because the question is, as you can read, I'll let you read that question. And I'm going to show you a couple of different areas. One, this is an old study, but it's, it's really, um, it's just still right on. They've, they've redone this study, um, and I was too lazy to create a new slide. But at any rate, this is an older, but it's, it's still pertinent. So this is what they did, and this is... Uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research, Harvard, paired with Harvard and the University of Chicago to do this study. And what they did is they, they responded to 1,300 uh, employer um, ads for employment in a variety of jobs. They submitted 5,000 resumes. And then they saw who would get interviews. The resumes were the same. There was a high-quality resume and a low-quality resume. So they were sort of generic resumes, but one was high-quality, like you went, you, know, you went through college, you did well in school, you, don't have, you, know, you, it, it, you have a good work experience. The other one was low-quality. It was kind of like, ah, well, I meant to go to college, but I didn't, you know, and I, I had a job one time. It's not as good of a, a, a lower quality, but they were the same. The low-quality ones were all the same. The high-quality was the same, except for one difference. They randomly assigned white-sounding names or very black-sounding names when they submitted those identical resumes. So the white examples were Emily Walsh or Greg Baker. African-Americans were Lakeisha Washington or Jamal Jones. Okay? And we can argue whether you think that's, you know, we should, that's just what they did. Okay? So let's see what happened. And they did it in a variety of cities, Chicago, Boston, um, and they did another city that's not up on this thing, but New York or somewhere. But <clears throat> you can see, first of all, that the white resumes were called back at a much higher rate just in general than the black-sounding names. What's more interesting, though, Look at the callback rates based on the quality of the resume. The high quality resumes are blue. The low quality resumes are red. Do you see the low quality white resumes had a higher callback rate than the high quality black sounding name resumes? Again, it's uncomfortable but it's, it's just facts. It's just, it is what it is. And so it affects employment decisions. And I could go through study after study about what happens once you go to work. I, I have a study about law firms and how they view the quality of um, memos that are written by their associates. And it's the same kind of thing a low quality, purposely low quality memo, writing memo, you know, you write memos as lawyers, uh, is rated by employers, both black and white employers, by the way, as um, lower, so it's, it, in generically, it's lower quality, you understand? It's rated, if it's submitted by a white person, as a higher quality um, work than the high quality sample submitted by who the employer thinks is an African-American employee. So it goes all the way through. Um, and so some people say, well, you know, there's a lot of causes. It's not just race. And there are. There are a lot of causes, a lot of things. But this study that was done in Texas is um, really unmatched in being able to do both what's called a longitudinal study where they followed kids for a, a, a I think it was a two-year a two period, and they followed 
uh, one million youth in Texas, all the kids in school in Texas. And they compared otherwise identical white, Hispanic, and black students. How did they do this? They controlled for all the factors that I was asking about in my case. Remember my case earlier? I'm trying to see what's different about these kids. Maybe they grew up in different neighborhoods. Maybe one of them's in a single-parent household and the other one's not. Maybe one has drug problems and the other one doesn't. All of those factors that, that are uh, uh, explanation other than race, 83 of them, everything they could think of, they controlled for. So they were able to look at specifically kids who had done identical things, came from identical backgrounds, with identical histories, or virtually identical histories, and what were their punishments. And what they showed was, as you can read up there, that black students were much more likely to be disciplined more severely, uh, disciplined at all, and then more severely than white or Hispanic students, um, interestingly. Black male students, m even higher likelihood of being punished more severely. And in fact, one of the things that they showed was that with um, what are called um, um, mandatory suspension crimes, there really wasn't any difference. So that's things like bringing a gun to school, robbing somebody in the bathroom, committing a sexual offense, punching a teacher, those kinds of things, a serious assault. There was no difference with those. But the biggest difference were, were in discretionary offenses. Talking back to a teacher, you know, throwing spitballs at somebody, um, taking something that didn't belong to you, like an ice cream sandwich from the lunch line, those kinds of things. And the more discretionary the offense, the more likely African Americans were punished and punished more severely. Um, one more, criminal justice. So this is a study where they looked at the interracial uh, aspect of cases on sentencing. So they went back and they looked at, in this study, all of uh, the black defendants um, who had um, been sentenced for um, homicides. And What they found was that when, and they divided those defendants, so these are real defendants, not, not these, the pictures, but in the study, they were real defendants with real sentences. And what they found was if the, and these are in homicide cases, and who was sentenced to death, if the victim was black and the defendant was black, it didn't really matter whether the defendant looked more or less stereotypically black, right? Based on skin color, the shape of your, all those kinds of those stereotypes that you have about what black people look like. The more stereotype, less stereotype, if the victim was African American, no real difference. If the defendant was black and the victim was white, you can see the difference. And it's stark. And again, it's just, it is what it is. Um, this last one that I'll show you is across a number of systems. And these are basically one-to-one -one analysis where the white people are the yellow line, so they're sort of the baseline. And the question is, do African Americans fare better or worse than in Hispanics? They're the green line, and African Americans are the red line across a number of domains. So with regard to health, diabetes deaths, and infant mortality rates, and you can see that African American uh, um, have much higher diabetes deaths and much higher rates of infant mortality, so almost two to one as compared to whites. Hispanics, it's roughly the same. And then education, so it's fourth graders that are below reading proficiency in fourth grade, and then out of school suspension. And you can see how the, how the African Americans are, what is it, five times more likely. It's a five to one ratio. Um, and then criminal justice, the prison population and searches per seatbelt violations, 
Um, so that's when you stop a car when they decide to search you or not search you. And, the, and African Americans are searched at much higher rates. I will let you know, though they're searched at much higher rates, they find contraband in white vehicles much more frequently when they search. Now, maybe that's because they only search white vehicles when they have all these other factors and they search every black person. I don't know. But that's another finding that's not on this graph. And then uh, CPS, children in foster care, and then economics, unemployment rates and children that are below poverty. And you can see that across all systems, there's a huge difference. And I think I'm going to stop here. I will tell you that there are things that you can do. We have an implicit bias to lecture, but there are a number of things that you can do in order to address or try to mitigate your implicit bias. Um, and some of them are very simple things, like literally some companies now have screensavers where they show people like an African-American person that's a lawyer, a white person that is um, in jail, whatever, D different, not, not all white people bad and black people good, but they show people in, in, non, uh, in, in outside of the, what you would normally stereotype people, and it's just on your screensaver. And that alone helps people ra have an available, a more available way of seeing somebody who's tall as a high jumper, right? Or a, ce or a cello player, or even a viola player, right? Or maybe even a piccolo. Hand's probably too big, but I don't know. Um, so that's one thing you can do. And there's a number of other things. Um, the most important thing really, though, is, and this is where I'll stop, is um, by slowing yourself down. One of the things we do now is we use checklists in court. That's why doctors use checklists, by the way. That's why astronauts and pilots use checklists. It's awful to use a checklist, but it makes you get all the information. And so checklists are really invaluable because the more information that you are consciously receiving that you force into your mind consciously, the more likely you are to make a better decision. And also by being aware that you are, have the potential to, make, to take shortcuts when you're about to make a decision is really valuable. So I read, before I go on the bench, I read the, this little thing about, hey, am I making this decision these are the questions I ask myself. Am I making this decision based on the evidence before me on this situation or based on 800 cases that I had in the past? And that's not just about race or gender, but it's about a tendency for judges. I hear two sentences of a case, and I'm like, ah, I've dealt with this a thousand times. I know what I'm going to do. And then I quit listening. And so if I remind myself beforehand, hey, you're going to do that. You're a human being, and it's the end of the day, and you're really tired. And then finally, one last thing that we do is the longer the day goes on, the worse people get. The more likely you are to succumb to, you're just exhausted. And so you just say, I don't care, I'll, just, I'll do whatever. And so I put important cases now in the morning or right after lunch. I try not to do them at the very end of the day. So I will stop there um, and leave this up. This is our group, the Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. I know it's late way later than I was supposed to be, but I will answer any questions that you all have, or if you want to stick around, I can answer them otherwise. So if there are a couple questions, I can ask, answer those now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've been waiting for Joe Biden to call me up, but they haven't called me. I was the judge, so, so I, I, um, I spoke to a lot of U.S. attorneys locally and then at specific offices, and then the folks at the, the, the I don't know what they are, the, whoever they are in Washington said, we want to get all the U.S. attorneys that, that want to participate to participate on a web thing. I said, sure. So I was supposed to do it, and then... During the Donald Trump administration, they said you're not allowed to do any of those kinds of trainings, so they stopped the, those trainings. They have not, that edict has been lifted, but they haven't rescheduled me specifically. They probably found a better speaker, uh, but 
they, they haven't asked me specifically to go back, but there's no, no prohibition against it. But there was a, for a time, there was, they weren't even allowed to hear about it. So the question was, let me just repeat the question that I answered, was uh, a few years ago I was supposed to make a presentation uh, to U.S. attorneys across the country about the same topic you just learned about, and right beforehand the uh, uh, executive branch, this is during Donald Trump's administration, forbid all training about anything to do with uh, implicit bias or a whole, a whole other range of topics. Um, related to bias, or whether that existed or not, because apparently in his world it doesn't. Yes? I don't know if that's on. He's got it. That I discovered today was when we were talking about Hispanics and the names and Jamal, I have a, a I work with the preschool and we have a family that's expecting and they are Hispanic. And I asked dad, I said, how many weeks to go? He said, we have five weeks. I said, do you have the name? He said, no, we haven't picked out. And, and we said, well, what about your name? He was like, no, I'm not gonna name a Mexican name. He said, I'm not gonna name my child a typically Hispanic. And he said, I'm not gonna do that to them. They're gonna go for job interviews and they're gonna be turned away. The father said that just this afternoon. He said that specifically. Well, I, this would normally be the point where originally Judge Ty Hands, whose name is Tyati Hands, I would say, tell your story. And she ran for re-election for the first time with the name Tyati Hands, and she lost. So then she was reappointed, and she ran again with the name Ty Hands, T-Y Hands, and she won. Make of that whatever you want. The other thing, just to come back to where you saw the uh, the coloration of skin tone, you know, mm -hmm. typical or mm -hmm. I can't remember how it was. Stereotypical. Yeah. Stereotypical. I don't. I really was watching a piece on the news last night where actually in the political ads, you talk about the political ads and the crime. They have actually darkened several key folks. Stacey Abrams was darkened in some of her campaign ads by her opponents. Um, as far as a, a few other key folks that are African American were darkened um, in things that were. That's been going negative. on since. Um, was it Willie Horton? Is that the name? The, I didn't George Bush that. the that senior. Uh, um, that was a uh, an allegation. I didn't. I was too young to kind of pay, to know, but I remember that allegation that the that the individuals in those they they darkened it purposely. Well. Yeah. Maybe one more question and then, because I know y'all don't want to be here all night, so one more question, then I can answer the rest if in the reception, if there's a reception. Any other questions? All right, then. Um, so here's the problem. I used to share them all the time, and I went one time to a presentation that was given to me by somebody who used my slides and had no idea what they were talking about. So we have so that so I can probably make the, I got to check with with RMJJ, um, and I want to make them available. My only concern is somebody will then take them and use them in a Sunday school class and get it, I'm not saying Sunday, I just, because we're at a church, and then say, here, and it'll be all backwards, because especially now, so let me check, and, and Carol, I'll talk to you about it offline, but um, especially now, people are more and more saying, well, where, show me the statistics, the statistic, show me the study, and so if you get, if you say something that's, and it's very easy to say something that is just, feels right, but it's not right during one of these presentations, then there's a whole, there are a lot of people that are looking to confirm their, already, their preconceived beliefs that this is a bunch of hooey. So that's why it's real. You want to make sure you're, you're sharing accurate information. And there's a professor out at UNCC named Susan McCarter 
um, who is in the social work department, who has basically, she validates all our stuff to make sure, because I'm just like, hey, what about this, what about this? So she then goes back and says, all right, Lou, this is accurate, you can talk about this, but no, not this, we don't have that information yet. So that's my only concern, so I'll, let me check with them, and then I'll talk to you offline about that, Carol. Yes, well, we have a lot, so our website, you can get a lot of the information on our website, so it's our, if you, it's up on the screen right now, it's www.rmjj.org, and it tells about what we're doing, but we decided we should do something about it um, so that hopefully one day, not me, but maybe my, grand, my grandson tells that story about the McDonald's and people don't know the difference. There was one British guy that didn't know, the only person I've ever had that didn't know, that, that couldn't understand, what do you mean, black guy? He didn't get it, but other than that, everybody's, I think he was British, but um, everybody else always knows which kid was white and which kid was black. So, but thank you guys for having me. I've enjoyed it.